Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker Brian Brown. Brian's work really got my attention with the Jaeger, an ultra-slick, cleaver-style blade on a neutral yet ergonomic ham- handle. Brown's designs and builds have given him a reputation for making clean, contemporary classics. While representing a diverse repertoire of design styles, his Warthog model won Tactical Knife of the Year at Blade Show 2021, and his most recent release, the smash hit Raptor, a double-peaked clip-point blade, which I'm quite fond of looking at, uh, shows this design versatility taking his lines as far away from the Jaeger as imaginable. We'll find out what makes him tick and how he got there, but first... Uh, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And while you're there, uh, check out some of the other videos. Also, you can download the podcast, uh, your favorite podcatcher, and then go to Patreon if you think what we do here is worth it and uh, help support us. The quickest way to do that is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, I will repeat that very long and complicated address. It's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever visit the knives online in the hopes of satisfying your need to possess them in the real world? Then you have a problem. You are a knife junkie. Brian, welcome to the show. How you doing? Great, Bob. How are you? I'm doing really well. Um, well, I guess I guess this is late coming, but congratulations on yes, winning uh, best tactical blade at, or best tactical knife at Blade Show 2021. What was the, what was the knife Thank that won? You. So that was the, uh, it was a custom mini warthog and the, uh, I have to think back cause I've made a couple of them since the, uh, it was a CTS XHP blade with, uh, just a titanium frame lock, but with what I call my dino hide texture on it and uh non flipper has a window in the blade so pretty easy deployment decent size window and one one thing that they mentioned which i kind of got shocked a little bit when they called my name so i really didn't even get to hear much of what they said on why they chose my knife which i was kind of bummed about but the one thing i did hear is uh easy deployment so that's kind of stuff they look at as being a tactical knife you know easy deployment um kind of the ergos of it stuff like that on on being able to open it use it i guess in a tactical situation you know but um yeah it was it was like i said it was a big shock to uh, it was the first award i've ever won for really anything like i've ever made in ever Wow. So it was it was a huge honor, and I keep the keep the award right here on the desk, so I still get to see it all the time, which is awesome. That's cool. Yeah, I, I uh, that knife in it in it that knife itself is really uh, pleasing to my eye. It's the kind of knife that I would love to own. It's kind of right up my alley. Uh, that too is kind of a double peaked clip point, right? And uh, it's got a, it looks like it's got a nice hollow grind, and then. A neutral, but again, neutral, but ergonomic handle, like um, the kind of handle you can turn in your hand and use in all different kinds of ways. Sure. Uh, though, if it were mine, I would have it and hold it and possess it and flip it and 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 then use my other knives for for the work. And I, I know guys sure. like you hate hearing that, but sometimes <laughs> that's the truth, at least until I'm used to owning something like that. And I'm not, I've never had one of your knives. Yeah, before. it takes a little getting used to. Um... I have a, I've, I've amassed a little collection of, of custom knives myself now. And the first couple I got were more of a look at this, hold it, carry it on Sundays when you go to church <laughs> type situation. And, you know, now that I've gotten a few more, you know, you think as a maker, I know that both these guys are, they build them to use them, right? you know, and, and so <clears throat> I, uh, I carry them as much as I can now when I'm not carrying my own stuff, obviously, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, a uh, been a lot of fun. So the, the award was best tactical knife. Now in, in, 
in your mind when you were building that? Were you building it as a tactical knife? And how do you define what that is? Everything that I've kind of designed from the beginning, even with just like my fixed blades, I've always kind of steered towards that, what they consider these days, you know, like the tactical style. Um, so like, for instance, this one I have on my desk is not anything I would ever make really. I mean, it's, it's more of a traditional style Tonto cord wrap, you know, Japanese style knife, you know, that's nothing. I love all styles, but it's just nothing that I really preferred to make. I liked the <clears throat> tactical style Kydex sheath. You're going to be using it, um, for anything and everything. I don't, some of these guys that do the tactical stuff, you know, they kind of gear towards sending um, knives to people in the military and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And if, if somebody approached me and wanted something for that, I, I'd make it for them, you know. But um, it was more kind of, I like that style, but I wanted something for people to carry every day. And so a lot of the stuff that I design, I try to make sure that, some of them are, yeah, they look kind of wild, but I still want them to be used and carried kind of on a daily basis. And so I've just always liked that tactical style and the, the, the rough textures, the darker colors, the aggressive grinds. And so um, the, I apologize if this doesn't focus very well, but, you know, the main thing that I love on these productions and my customs is getting these big tall hollows mm -hmm. with the machine grinds in it. I love seeing the grind lines. I, I like a good clean hand rub and Damascus as well, but the just rough beat up look kind of, and he, when he, we were scrolling through just a second ago, one of the collabs I did recently um, with another two makers, the guys over at Kenis and Knives, hmm. one of the frame finishes and the blade finishes was just, I basically torched the crap out of the frames and tumble them as much as I could just to make them look beat up. Mm -hmm. And uh, between that one, and, you know, another one that was kind of a fancier version of the exact same knife, if I was going to choose one for me, it was going to be the one that looks like it's been beat to crap. Right. I, I've always enjoyed part that. Of the yeah, well, it's part of the style. It's part of the the aesthetic you're going for. Um, sure. So you mentioned the tall, hollow grind. I mean that that to me is uh, one of the first aesthetic cues that really turned me on. Um, back in the '80s, probably before you were born, <laughs> but the uh, the Cold Steel Master Tanto had a deep, hollow grind. And you could see the grind lines, and it was a it was something that I was aware of and available and tactical as the day is long, and and that too is my taste. So I see what you what you mean about that appeal, that look of I mean something about that seeing the light play in a deep hollow grind, yeah, um, is is very intoxicating. And and you know what's so funny about that is so from the the version one of these production Jaegers to the version two. So the version ones were with we knife. Oh, okay. Um, and then the version two swapped to Riot. And I I've mentioned this before. I sent them both the exact same, uh, 3d CAD file and <clears throat> Riot just has different ways of, of programming and, and running their, their blades through the grinders and how they just, they do everything just it's different. And, when they showed up and I started seeing the pictures and I, and I had, you know, updated drawings of how the grind was going to be. And I knew it was going to be a hollow, but I didn't realize how good it was going to be. And you like that grind so much. I like that grind so much. And there's so many people out there that love that big, tall hollow. I think that's what made that knife what it is. If it didn't have that big, tall hollow, the popularity of it, I don't think would be where, where it is now. And it's just, it kind of blows my mind that just that one aspect that changed from the version ones, which did great. 
and it was a great knife. It was a great build. We did a great job with them. Also but, hollow ground on that. We, yes, okay. but it was very minimal. Okay. It was almost like a, like a 16 inch kind of versus these are more like probably like a 12. Okay. But <clears throat> they were tumbled. You can't really tell that it's even a hollow. And so, um, when the when these came out and i did the satin version with that big tall satin machine grind on it from riyadh it just you know that's kind of what i think made that knife blow up like it did yeah that just plus that. oh i'm sorry go ahead, go ahead. There, there's also been a, a real focus on um, blade geometry uh, which is one of one of the great developments from from the uh, explosion of the knife world and knife uh, YouTube reviewers and the knife community and people talking to each other about knives right. is, oh yeah, these are also supposed to cut, you know, they're not just, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and uh, you know, objects of desire, they're supposed to cut too. And, and uh, nothing like great geometry, nothing cuts like great geometry. And boy, I'll tell you with a, with a thin hollow grind, especially Riot it's just happened to have a hollow ground Riot with sure. it. I mean, they they really know what they're doing. And then their their machine satin is also very appealing to the eye. So I I think that you're right. I bet that your grind was the thing that really made the Jaeger take off. I would say that, but then I would also say that the profile of it, the look of it, the blade. Sure. Tell me about the blade. How did you it's kind of audacious? What how did you come up with it? <laughs> Well, you know, it, all my designs really um, started as fixed blades. And the way I, I don't really have a, a ritual with, with designing or anything, it, they all kind of start out as I kind of want a certain blade shape because, you know, that's what kind of makes a knife function differently and for different applications is the shape. And so I like all kinds of knives. I like all different styles of knives. And so I did like a drop point was like the very first, you know, just a, a simple drop point knife was the first thing I designed. And I was like, all right, well, let's do like a, like a Tonto. And then I did like the, the taco with the Tonto. And then, um, I was like, well, let's, let's flip it. Let's go to the opposite of that. Let's do a Warren cliff. And so I, I, I did, uh the taka design which was the tonto when i was doing just the fixed blades um i was like well let's just keep it all the same and for ease of 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 building them and and i like the the handle shape and the geometry of everything with the taka i was like well let's keep everything the same but change the blade and it was basically just flipping the blade upside down and, and it worked and I was like, well, that's kind of cool. And so I had one point I had three different variations with the same exact handle. And so then when I started getting into folders, I wanted the Taka to be like the main knife. So I was like, well, I want to design the Warren Cliff style first because the Taka, the Tonto version was my best selling fixed blade of this is what everybody always asked for. And so I was like, well, I'm going to do the Jaeger first because I want to kind of learn what I'm doing and get the hang of it before I do this, because I really want to know what I'm doing when I start doing these takas, because I, I really felt that's what my popular knife was going to be. Mm. And, it, and it is, but the Jaeger just, it, <laughs> even with the customs before the productions, people loved them. And so it just kind of was a, I wanted to draw a Warncliffe style blade. And then I wanted to make that my first folder design because I really liked making them. I liked the, and I just happened to have a custom one here. I liked the same thing as just like on the, on the productions, just that, that tall satin mm -hmm. hollow with the swedge on the top and I just really enjoy the shape personally. It's a great usable every day back to, you know, like I said, I just like stuff that you can use every day and that blade shape, it's got a nice tip on it. It works. 
it's got a, a long flat on it so you can chop stuff or lay it flat on a table and if you need to cut through something it works and so i think that's why people really love that blade shape and why the jaeger became so popular but it just you know it, it's it just kind of happened you know it, so that there was no plan really of <laughs> of it it just all of this just the whole knife thing in general just i kind of fell into it oh okay well how did how did you just fall into it and start making the Jaeger, <laughs> etc.? No, I mean, how did you just fall into it? I don't really, I don't really want to say I just fell into it. You know, I, I did put work in, but, right. <clears throat> you know, so the whole backstory kind of when I started making knives was I did uh, woodworking. My dad had a woodworking shop at our, at our house growing up and he still does. And that's where my shop is right now. But um, he would go out there on the weekends, tinker around and stuff like that. And I would go out there and do the same thing occasionally. And, and it was fun. I'll always, I've always liked using my hands. I've liked making stuff, taking stuff apart. And so growing up, I would, like I said, I'd go out there and tinker, do, do this and that out there. And, and it was fun. And then I wanted to make a knife. I was like, well, we don't know anything about steel working or doing anything grinding. We didn't have equipment for that, you know? So I found these kits to where you can make uh, just the handles. It was a pre-ground um, blade sharpened and everything. All you gotta do is put a handle on it, make a sheath for it and it's done. And I did a couple of those, it was a lot of fun. I actually sold one to a customer of mine at my old job. And I ran across a guy on YouTube um, up in Canada, y'all may have heard of him, uh, Aaron, I think his name, last name is G-O-U-G-H. I think it's pronounced golf or go, but, um, he had a video on there of how to make a knife with basic tools and everything step-by-step step from buying. He said, go buy a one tool steel from Amazon. Here's the link. Here's how to build this file jig and you use just a rough cut file and you file these bevels. And I was like, I can do that. I've got a lot of that stuff. Dad's got a lot of that stuff and I'm going to give it a go. And I gave it a go and I liked it. It was fun. And it was something that after I got done working and, you know, kids were, or at the time it was just one, but, you know, we put the kid in bed and my wife would go do whatever. And, and she's, she's an early to bed type person. So it gave me time at night to do whatever I wanted. So I'd go make a knife and start working on knives. And it would take me, you know, a month, two months to do one, just because I had a, a little fold out workmate and a single garage light and I'm hand filing, you know, and you're talking, you know, two days to, to do the bevels on these things. And I just, I loved it. It was a lot of fun. And then you know, it just kind of spiraled into my buddies like, well, you sold one or two. You should make a, you not a YouTube, uh, uh, Instagram account, Facebook account, something, you know, post them pictures, you know, other people want to buy them. I was like, no, nobody's going to want to buy these like that. I'm not gonna, you know, he's like, just trust me. He's like, they're good. And so I did. And people on there started seeing them and wanted them. And, and I got lucky to start before Instagram got real crazy like it is now. And, you know, I was actually getting a lot of people starting following me pretty regularly. And, um, I wasn't, you know, blocked by the algorithm and all this. And I actually got to put my stuff out to the audience that is on Instagram and people wanted to buy them. And so I made them and it just turned into a, you know, kind of a side hustle, which kind of turned into a side job. Uh, I was off every Monday. My wife would go to work, kids would go to daycare and I would go make knives every Monday. And it was pretty much like a second income for us. <clears throat> and it got to the point of if, if I don't try to do this full time, um, I'm going to regret it, you know, down the road, you know, I was, I had a good job pay wise, um, it was in retail selling stuff at a, at a shop, but it was a hundred percent commission. So, you know, paychecks one month to the next, depending on the time of year, they're good, they're bad, they're good, they're bad. And 
I wasn't having it. I, I was, I was tired of it. I didn't want to do it. I hated it, but you've got kids, you've got responsibilities, you know, and, yeah. and I just, I took a risk and, and that's, I've been very blessed to have a good following and, and a supportive wife who, who let me, we had three kids in daycare at the time when I quit in 2018. Mm -hmm. And that's a big bill to pay each month. And oh, yeah. thankfully she trusted me enough to, uh, to do it. And thank the Lord it's worked. Yeah. And, and you, you said, you know, you took this risk and, and, uh, you, you'd kick yourself if you never went full time. And, and the, that fear of regret is a great motivator. Um, but also it's almost like if you don't go full time, how will you ever know how good you can be at that thing? You know, because you can't have two full time jobs. You can't work a full time job, come home, be with your family, make dinner, clean up and then right. do a whole other full time <laughs> job every day. You just can't do that. So in, in a sense, if you feel like you've got something, the, the like the promising, promising germinating seed of something sure. and you don't try and go full time, you'll never know how good you can be. And, and I, I was feeling that and it was it was just like you said it it was like i, I want to know what i can do with this where can this go and it, it was just you know it was, it was risky and it was hard and you know it was a dumb decision almost because of the kids because of the bills and, you know, I, it's just, it's still like, I, I say it all the time, how grateful I am for all these customers that I've been able to reap, get and gain. And, you know, I, all these pre-orders that sell out so fast and I, I have knife drops or when the stuff comes in and they sell out so fast. And, and I just, I never anticipated it. It was going to be me making custom fixed blades and some custom folders. And, and even, you know, in 2018, when I first did this, you know, Riot and we and, you know, people getting into that world was still kind of new. And my little plan in my mind of where I wanted to kind of start and take this, that wasn't even in it. You know, that just kind of, excuse me, it kind of, you know, manifested itself with seeing other people do it and i was like man i that's and that was another risk i was like i wonder if i can you know get some production knives out there and just you know get more to the masses and it's like man that's a lot of money to have to put up front that's mm. not yours you know and and you know i'm i'm thankful that everybody trusts me with their money with these pre-orders and and stuff like that and so it's it's just kind of turned into this like i said it just i never planned this it just kind of almost by accident but i don't i don't like saying that but i mean <laughs> it, it it's the truth you know it's because i say that because i didn't sit down and have like a business plan when i did this you know, people go and start a business and they got these business plans and they go get these business loans. And I didn't do that. I just kind of quit my job and went to my garage. <laughs> <laughs> That's my plan, baby. <laughs> and, you know, and, and was, you know, Hey, send me some PayPal for this. and I'm going to send it to you in the mail. And that was it. You know, Brian, it, it's, it strikes me that, um, and and you know this is this is totally an unscientific thought but it seems like the kind of people who have you know really buttoned down business plans and and thorough you know uh um uh, what do you call it executive uh, uh you know the whole thing planned out yeah. are generally um uh business people whose main business is business uh but you are a knife maker and 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 like everyone else almost many, many other people I've spoken to on this show, the love is of making knives. And then the business is a necessary evil in some cases or a fun yeah, challenge, you know, uh, but, but it's just, uh, you know, it's a thing that comes along with success. Yeah, and, and 
learning that, um, you know, I, I went to college for like, I think two semesters after I graduated high school and I, I had no clue what I wanted to be, what I wanted to do. Um, I'll, I've mentioned this before too, and, and other talks with the guys and like, I, with the names of all these knives and stuff, I was, you know, I wanted to be a pilot that didn't work out horrible eyesight, killer blind, mm. dumb as a bag of rocks when it comes to math, but, <clears throat> um, I had taken, you know, a little bit of business classes in college and stuff. So I knew a little bit and then being in retail for 10 plus years, you learn and some of that stuff, you know, not really how to run your own business, but you learn a lot about customer service mm -hmm. and the face to face side of things, or, you know, even though it was, you know, all on everybody's screens. I kind of learned how to, I guess, sell my brand. You know, I don't like calling it a brand. It's weird to me. It's I'm just a knife maker, but I guess now with the way everything's going, it's, it's a brand. Now people recognize the B yeah. and know who it is now. And, and so, <clears throat> like you said, it's a necessary evil. I, I don't like sitting at this computer doing paperwork you know, having to pay sales tax every month and pay tax tax, you know, every yeah, year, yeah. you know, it sucks, but it, it's part of it. And, and learning it, I've got a appreciation for business owners and what all these other small business owners have to go through. And so it's, you gain a lot of respect for other business just in general um, once you start doing this on your own and it's, it's been a big eye opener for sure. You said brand, you have difficulty with the word or the concept of the brand. Um, and it, it, it occurs to me that a brand is actually branding your branding. Your work is actually a really good thing. It's almost like having an LLC. It's like a, a shield between you and the work you put out. Um, so you can go about your, your life and be a scumbag uh, I, not that you are, but what, what I'm saying is I, uh, and then produce, still produce great knives and the brand is what carries, like, who cares what, what Bob DeMarco is like, all that I care about is that his videos are good or, sure. or what have you. And that's, that's to me what the brand's purpose is. It's just, it is more than you are. It is, it is the feelings that people get for your knives, you know? Yeah, and I, and I think the part that's kind of weird to me is my brand isn't like Microtech or, you know, Kershaw. It's not like a different name. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's my name. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's me and only me because, you know, I still have yet to try to hire anybody to help me do anything. My wife helps me here and there. My parents help me here and there, but I have, you know, my, my buddy helped me do some stuff. Um, I don't know if you ever saw like those little, uh, the bit drivers we were doing and stuff. Oh yeah. Um, that was actually a buddy of mine helping me do those for me just because I was focusing on knives, but you know, it's still, it's, it's, it's me and it's like my name out there for the world. And like you, and they, they, honestly, there was at one point, not too long after I had gone full time that I was thinking about changing the name because I was like, do I really want this just to be my name? Cause you start thinking about like these other big brands like Microtech, or then you see like Kershaw and ZT. And then I was like, well, so, and, and I mentioned it to like one or two guys I would talk to regularly, like on Instagram, kind of just collectors and, and, and friends I had gained in the knife world. And they're like, leave it. That's what people know you for. Look at like Chris Reeve. Yeah. You know, Ken Ken Onion. Onion. you know, guys like that, you know, Ken Onion and Ken Onion Design, you know, his stuff out there is probably the most recognizable stuff in the world. And he goes by Ken Onion Design. They're like, just own it basically. Just quit worrying about, you know, it being your name out there, you know, just 
you stand behind your stuff, you stand behind your your business and, and your knives, you're going to be fine. It's not going to matter if it's your name plastered on everything. And so I just kind of took that advice. and I was like, you know, they're right. I just kind of need to own it. Yeah. And, and of course, the first thing that came to my mind was Chris Reeve knives or Rick Hinderer knives or Emerson knives or any, any, you know, any, I, I think that that's good because who knows who the hell is designing a, a zero tolerance, you know, if right. it's not a collaboration, it's, it's, it's nameless, faceless, but, um, so I, I want to find out a little bit about your process and <clears throat> how you go about, uh, what it, you know, what your creative process looks like when you're coming up with a new knife, you're generating new designs. Um, you know, I want to, I want to know stuff. Do you draw on paper? Do you, do you design in CAD? Like I'm completely zero paper, zero no paper. So <clears throat> before I learned CAD, I, I did some of my early stuff and I still have them somewhere since I've moved. I don't remember exactly where I put them, but I still have a lot of the papers, like the the little cleaver I did early on was the, I called it the flying Dutchman. And uh, it was drawn on paper and I learned real quick stuff on paper <laughs> looks bigger than when it does in real life, because I drew this thing out and then I traced it out on the steel and I made one. I was like, man, this thing's tiny. Uh -huh. It looks a lot bigger on paper. And so, <clears throat> And it, you know, like I said, the, really the way I start is I want to have a certain blade shape. So I'll kind of draw the blade shape how I want it and put my own spin on it. And then I design the handle. And so obviously with folders, I have to make sure the blade fits inside the handle. And so whereas with the fixed blades, I, you, you know, you really kind of do whatever you want. You just want to make sure it's comfortable. It doesn't actually have to, you know, fit anything in it. And so um, I still kind of approach it the same way it, with, with the folders or, you know, whether it's a custom or the production. Um, and I, I've, I've taught myself how to do just basic like 2D AutoCAD, but I've also sat around watching YouTube videos and, and taught myself how to use Fusion. And so <clears throat> what, what really I like about the Raptor so much with these is I did this all myself in, in CAD um, from the 2D to the 3D. And there's very, very minimal changes that Riot actually did to these. So it was kind of a big step forward for me. Um, and it made me feel good that I could take the whole process into this. Cause you know, down the road, so I decide I wanna buy my own CNC I know that I can get you know at least the design part right. in the 3D world because it's complete. It thinking in 3D compared to 2D was just mind blowing to me. It's crazy. And it was such a big learning curve to have to draw and make parts in 3D. And so when I was able to actually successfully do that, it it was fun. And so I'll sit around. And it'll take me days, weeks, months on, on a design, you know, it just kind of, kind of varies on, on, you know, it, I'll look at it, I'll, I'll do something and then I'll go back, you know, a day or two later, or a week later and look at it again. And like, I don't really like that. And I've had stuff that I've just completely scratched and started all over again. And <clears throat> then I've had stuff. And, and really kind of what's it's funny is the Jaeger was one of them. I remember, which that's the, probably the last thing I ever drew on paper was sitting at my old job. I think it was the beginning of like January of 2018. I've got the paper somewhere and I even dated it when I, when I drew it out. Um, I drew it at work just kind of on a sheet of paper. And it was one of the only designs that I kind of drew out. And I've made small tweaks and revisions just from what I've learned about building folders, but really from the initial design to what it is, other than some, like I said, functionality tweaks and aesthetic tweaks to like cover up the detent track, you know, it's a little stuff like that, that I didn't know would be an issue. It's almost identical to what that drawing is. 
-hmm. And then there's other stuff like the Raptor. I drew multiple versions of that um, to get it kind of where it is now before it, it got produced. So it's, so, lear so learning the Fusion 3D, the 3D part of it really made you much more self-sufficient. I mean, it is one right. thing to come up with. A, I mean, it's no small thing to come up with a, a beautiful design and a profile and a 2D, you know, image. That's no small thing. But then to take it and, and make it 3D, that's uh, it seems like a whole other skill. And it seems like you are learning that, you know, put you in a, a very good spot. Yeah, and, and it's it's weird is I, I guess it's kind of how a lot of knife makers are is we can take a, a flat pencil drawing or a 2d cad drawing of of a knife and we kind of can see in our mind how we want it to look how we want it to be contoured how we want the blade grind to look and we kind of know which way we want to take it and i was able to do that with all the stuff that i did fixed blade wise folder wise when i started doing it on my own but <clears throat> i wanted to know what i was getting whenever I was going to do a production. So I didn't know fusion, thankfully a good buddy of mine, um, Edward R, um, Edward R knives, Ed Ratnan, he is, uh, pretty good at fusion and taught me a bunch of stuff early on. And he did the first Jaeger design based off of my 2d drawing. He took it, put it, I told him how I wanted it. And we went back and forth with each other, tweaking it. That way I was able to send we a full 3d model and i would have an idea of okay this is what it's going to look like before they got it and then they do their tweaks and revisions to it for their production process which had to have you know minor changes but i didn't want to have to keep doing that i don't want to have to keep he would help me with all these if i asked him to but i don't i want to do everything to where i don't have to rely on anybody and I've been like that with everything that I do. Um, early on, I didn't have a mill when I started making folders. I'd have a buddy whose dad owned a machine shop locally mill stuff for me on the knives. And I was using a drill press and counterboards trying to make knives. And it was absolutely horrible. Oh, God. That's <laughs> it was excruciating. Terrible. And then you got to wait on them to, you know, get your parts for you. And then I had to, for a long time, I had to send stuff out for heat treat because I couldn't afford the oven. So, and I, I had a lot of holdups early on with waiting on other people. And so that kind of got me motivated to where it's like anything and everything I want to do, I want to be able to do myself. And the only thing, obviously I outsourced the entire production knife, but mm -hmm for the custom side the only thing that i don't do myself is water jet that's just not feasible for me to really own my own water jet and i just get my profiles water jet and what's even better with that is local they're in mississippi it's, can't beat that and they do a bunch of stuff in the knife world so nice. it's i don't want to rely on people so i've taught myself everything i know really is is self-taught I've never had any formal training in any of this. Well, let me ask you, when you're in the design process, and I think this is going to be an annoying question uh, because people have asked me this uh, for other things, but how do you know when you're done? Mm. Yeah, you're never done. So <clears throat> the Jaeger, I'm on number... I think this was the last, I know this was the last one I finished and this is number 53. So I've made 53 full size Jaegers and I have the mini that I do. And I'm on like the mid twenties of those. And they're basically identical other than one literally is just the ends are cut off. There was really no redesign at all. It's the same thickness, height, everything. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> even with this last batch of blades that I had water jet, I've made tweaks to the air and it's nothing that anybody will really ever see, but there's ever, I swear every single one, if you laid them all out, you could look and find minute differences. And so even with 
the, like these production ones. Um, this between the first run and the second run, we changed manufacturers, but second run to the third run was the first time that, or I'm sorry, I did do a second run with, with Riot with the exclusives, but then from there, there was no changes. The first time that there was no changes made to them on anything. And it was just, it was weird to me. It, it, I, I was like, I, I always feel like I need to, you know, make it better. There's always something different and people just love them as they are. And I really couldn't find anything to tweak other than if I wanted to change something aesthetically but i really don't want to tweak them now just because there's getting to be so many out there there's going to be so many different versions yeah that yeah granted yeah. you can't really swap frames and blades that well but all the different color styles of the frames and the clips and the show scales that are going to be coming out with this whole batch of carbon fiber inlay ones i did and people starting to change out the inlays and, um, you know, kind of a, a teasers there, there's a guy that's, um, working with a couple guys in my group that are working on, um, machining different inlays and different inlay materials that I haven't offered as a production oh. that way people, if they want to swap them out, they can. And so it, it kind of, you know, is reminding me of like what these guys do with like the pm2 and all the different scales and, right. and stuff that are offered and it's like it's kind of mind-blowing to me that they're doing it with something that i've created yeah you've you've done it like like you won the jaeger contest so you don't have to do any more to that that is i mean that's a beautiful thing to know you've gotten feedback from a substantial um collector base or fan base whatever sure. you want to say and they've told you you're good on this one. Go Don't work on your next yeah. and, and keep pumping them out, you know, at least and, as many so that I can get one. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. It, 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 yeah. And it, it's just, I guess I'm just, this the humble side of me is it's weird to me is I've never been very, very good at something or the popular person at something. I've never stood out exceptionally at anything I've ever done. I've always just kind of been average. I'm, my wife tells me all the time, she's like, you're, you're just kind of good at everything you do. I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty good at a lot of things, but I'm just not great at anything. And then now that I kind of gotten into the knife world, people are like, you gotta give yourself some credit. You, you've done something pretty crazy with just everything you've built. And, and I don't know, it's just hard for me to do, but you know, so like, but back to your original question is, um, I like changing stuff. I like the development of, of the, the process. And so even this next run of Raptors, other than one or two little things mechanically that really needed to be tweaked, um, I made other changes myself. Aesthetically, just real tiny stuff here and there that I wanted to change that probably didn't need it, but I feel like it'll just make it like from the version one Jaeger to the version two Jaeger. I think it'll just take it that next step right. and time, time will tell when they well, show up. I got to congratulate you again. And that is on the Raptor. Cause it was really uh, fun to watch it uh, explode. I mean, people went crazy for it and, and here's here. This was great. When I found out uh, the size, I was thrilled because uh, that I prefer a larger knife. And I was like, thank God, because, <laughs> and the reason I'm saying that is because I saw, I saw the, uh, fury or not the fury. What's the term I'm looking at? I, I saw, uh, you know, um, the buzz. The, the buzz, I saw how much people were into it. And I'm like, you know, and, and I'm, I, I usually miss out on everything exciting. Um, <laughs> you know, and so I was I like, well, <laughs> I'm like, I know I'll miss this. Um, so I saw it. it I, I think it is a beautiful knife. I would Thank love you. to I, I would love to own one. I am a huge fan of the clip point. The the double peaked clip point look like it, re, it always reminds me of the Mac V Sog knives from Vietnam. Yeah. And uh, and the handle is beautiful. I, I really, really think it's a, a gorgeous knife. So I wanted to take my Thank hat you. off to you there. Um, you. Any any um, you're quite welcome. Any plans for an XL version that I should start saving for? <laughs> 
you know, it's funny is I've actually had a couple of people ask me for, which <clears throat> to me, like my full size custom Jaegers, that that's about as big as I personally like. Um, How long is, is that blade there? The overall is about eight inches mm -hmm. and the, the cutting edge is about three and a quarter. You know, if you measure here, here, it's about three and a half, little, little under. <clears throat> but I just kind of see like the sweet spot for the masses, everybody says is about seven and a half. Mm -hmm. And that's really, so what was kind of funny is that's kind of the, what people say is the sweet spot. And that's kind of how I see it as well. That was eight inches. The mini is uh, six, six and a half. And I was like, well, that gives me a seven and a half. I can use, you know, kind of for my production model, which will be perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, then with the Raptor, you know, people like this, people have asked for bigger Jaegers but I, I won't make them bigger because I have the customs. I try to keep them kind of separate. And <clears throat> if you can't tell, these were based off of the, the Warthog with this yes. double D kind of clip point, drop point style blade. And that's real reminiscent of the Raptor, but I didn't, or excuse me, the Warthog. And I didn't want to do the Warthog as a production and a custom. I, like I said, I want to keep them separate. So, this is essentially a slim down version of a warthog. It's just, it's thinner all the way around. Oh, and so yes. I wish, I wish I had a, a warthog here to kind of show them, but it, it's real similar to the blade shape. If this had the window in it, like the yes. Jaeger, you'd really be able to tell. And people have asked for the window. I'm like, I can't. It's just, to me, it's going to be too much like the warthog. It'll get yeah. a little bit. And people early on when I was showing the prototypes and stuff, um, a few people kind of confused them between when they saw these and saw the Raptor. And, oh, I don't know who this Brian Brown guy is, but I like <laughs> this Raptor. Well, then they would see like a custom Warthog and they'd be like, whoa, where'd you get that Raptor or something? You know, they were kind of mm, getting a yeah. little stuff. Yeah. But now that they're kind of out there, people can tell that, see the, you know, the differences in them. But, um, you know, this was a complete 180 from the Jaeger. Mm -hmm. And as it's slim and it's sleek, it's curvy, it's not, I mean, this thing, it's, I joke around all the time, it's just a brick. It's just, <laughs> I like, it's like I got lucky with a, with a, a, a nice handle style and a brick of a blade, you know, it's just so squared off. And I was like, well, my second version, I need to go the complete opposite direction. And so, um, I don't know, back to your question of going bigger, <clears throat> possibly just because, uh, the only complaint I get about these is how slim the handle is. And it makes it really easy to get your finger on the lock bar. I think I had one no. person maybe say they had a tough time opening the Jaeger, um, just because of, they were left-handed and like, it's mm. real awkward for a lefty and, um, where this being so sleek, if, if you're not just really used to keeping your finger off that lock bar, you're going to have a hard time and thumb studs don't make it any easier. Mm -hmm. If it had a flipper right. tab, it would be easier to hold it, but just it, it you know, so there, there's another tweak I want to make there when I hear these things, I really don't want to put a flipper on it, but doing an inset lock or a liner lock would eliminate that issue because you don't have yeah. a lock bar in the way. So, um, but yeah, I have had other people ask for a larger version, which I don't know. That's, that's something I have to think on. Um, because I got to make sure it's going to be something that people want, obviously, and make sure, sure there's enough to where if I, I take the Riot and, you know, do four or five, 600 of these things that people are going to want to buy them. So uh, just briefly, I mean, we have a general idea, but what's what's it like when you uh, finish a design and you're ready to take it to the presses, so to speak? Uh, how does it work um, in dealing with OEM companies, just in general? It, it's real easy, honestly. It's way easier than I thought it would be. Um, it, it's basically you you have your design, and you reach out to them and say, Hey, um, 
they they want you to be a knife maker. They don't want to have just like Joe Blow off the street. So, you know, there's guys out there that are knife designers. They may have a little more issue early on when they didn't have anything out there in the world. It was easier for me because I had custom folders out in the world already. I had custom fixed blades. I had like three and a half years of making knives. So they knew I already had a knife business and they were okay with it going ahead and saying, all right, this guy's legit. He's not just trying to what, you know, whatever. So like just with, with Riot and with we, you know, I just, I, I said, Hey, this is what I want to do. Uh, here's the file. Here's kind of what uh, I want to do quantity wise. <clears throat> and then they take it and they, they take your 3d file and they send it to their engineers and their engineers, that know the whole manufacturing process and they've all probably know a lot more about lock geometry and stuff than I do. Um, which was one thing that, that Riot did, they completely swapped around the lock geometry on both of these from the way I actually had it designed and it, the way it's designed is how my customs are and mm. it works great, but maybe for the manufacturing process and, and mass production, the way they do it, Maybe this way is better um, <clears throat> for that aspect, but they changed. It didn't change the overall look of it. They actually, Riyadh actually changed the look of the flipper tab from the, the version one Wii's to the version twos. We kind of basically took exactly what I drew, which was just kind of a, a rectangle off the back and looking at it now, this is a lot sleeker, looks a lot better. Riyadh actually did this themselves. I didn't redesign this myself. When they changed the lock <clears throat> geometry around, they changed the flipper tab. They made it smaller. They put it a little bit higher. It's in a better spot. It functions better. So they actually have all that knowledge, which in turn has actually helped me on some of my custom stuff because I kind of looked at what they've done with these. And I'm like, well, I could tweak that on my side too. Hmm. And, and it's better. And then basically from there, it's they, they get you to approve the drawings. And then you pay for prototypes, you tell them what you want, you know? So if you were going to do like two different versions that were completely different. So really I only got one prototype for the, the Jaeger because they were all titanium. And then I did the inlay version. <clears throat> there was a little mix up. I was supposed to get one inlay, one, one full tie. And I ended up with three inlays. Mm -hmm. But I just kind of was like, I know how it's going to be. There's not really any sense on me waiting, you know, months again for another, another one. So we rolled with it. And, uh, and then you just, they tell you, here's how much money you owe us. And here's the time frame. And then you just send them money and, and wait. You see, and you, and a box comes and you see your design, uh, <laughs> created by, I mean, Riyadh, they're undeniably amazing. I mean, their work yeah. is awesome. And, and, and I would imagine, I, I can only imagine the thrill of seeing your design, like uh, materialized it's, it's a, without any of your own handwork, but it, that and the relief of like, like I mentioned before, these pre-orders, it's just the relief that mm -hmm. I, I got these in people are about to get what they paid me money for, you know, four or five months ago, yeah. six months ago is how it's been lately but um you know it's just it's a huge relief and it's it's humbling too especially with these last couple runs that i've done which like with this next jaeger run i mentioned it's it's 1900 knives and that just wow. it's the fedex guy's gonna hate me <laughs> <laughs> you tip them tip them in knives here you go buddy yeah, yeah. So, you know, and it's, I just, I keep saying it, but it just kind of blows my mind how, what this has turned into for me. And it's just, I'm so grateful for everything. And, you know, it's, it's better than Christmas when all those boxes show up and you see all these versions for the first time, you know, I'm digging through these things as fast as I can trying to find them because I want to go take a picture of them and post them so people can see, you know, what they look like other than just, you know, shout out to the guy that does my renderings. They're impeccable. They look like real knives and mm. they're not. 
And so <clears throat> then you get them in hand and it's just like, it's, it's, it's better than Christmas because it's, you know, like you said, it's something that you've designed, something that you've had, you've been waiting months and months and months for, and you've worked on this design for months. So it's, you know, something that's could have been, you know, multiple years in, in the making. And then it shows up and there's a box that you've got three, four, five, seven hundred people waiting on this thing that you created. And it's just like, wow. Waiting with a substantial amount of money in their hand, which is which is another thing that is that so where where do you want to see Brian Brown knives in the future? Short short term, I want to get my shop done. So I don't know how close you follow me on social media. I moved back in October um, to this awesome new house and finally have my own office, which this is supposed to be a dining room and my wife doesn't care for a dining room. So I'm grateful for that, oh, yeah. that she let me take over this as, as my office and my, my workstation over here is where I box all the knives, all the packing materials, everything is in here and I've got my own space. And then, um, but anyway, I'm, I'm building the shop out in the back and, um, getting moved out of my dad's shop. Hopefully, hopefully after blade show, I'll be able to move and the shop will be done. Um, that's, that's near future. And then, you know, next two to three years, I really do want to start focusing on getting a CNC for myself and incorporating. I don't really want to dive into production mode for myself, um, kind of like what Oz machine company does. Mm -hmm. I fully respect what he does, but that's not really what I want to do. I still like the handmade side of it. I like doing them one at a time. Batches, it's too much production type assembly line work, and I don't really like it, but I want to have a CNC and kind of use it in a way like um, Michael Birch. So he incorporates all this crazy milling and venting and all this stuff that would be incredibly hard to do with like a panograph or by hand manually. So he uses the CNC for stuff like that. And that's kind of really what I want to do is I'd be able to create a lot different stuff than what I do now. A lot of different aspects of just <clears throat> crazy stuff on the frames and and I mean, inlay possibilities, just being able to do a single inlay would be, you know, ecstatic for me to be able to do something like that. And so <clears throat> I, that's, that's the next big step for me is wanting to go and get a CNC and learn that side of it and just kind of add, you know, that other, you know, feather in my hat of something else that I've been able to learn how to do. And, um, you know, who knows after that, you know, I, I, I don't, <clears throat> the production was going to be like a one, maybe two thing a year of 300 piece runs and, you know, and, and it, it's turned into, you know, half my business now. And I still focus on my customs as much as possible. And in my mind, I don't really want to say those are more important or primary, but I still feel like I have to be at the shop every day making knives because that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And so, <clears throat> um, I've, I've had to kind of step back and realize that I've got these thousands of other customers that can't afford customs that want the production and are supporting me by buying these. And I really have to focus on that just as much as that. So, you know, the balance is tough, but, you know, I've, I think I've gotten the hang of it, kind of. But, you know, who knows? I, I, and, you know, five, ten years down the road, what I'll be doing. I'm, I'm not that great at planning Sorry, that far. Don't, don't mean to play the guidance counselor at high school. So, Brian, no, where, no. Where, where, where will your life be? Hey, Brian, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I think you're... Uh, well, thank you. I, you're quite welcome. I think your knives are really cool. Incidentally, the warthog and the and the raptor, my two favorite of yours, um, uh, are both named after two of my favorite airplanes. So that's that's there pretty sweet. Uh, but I, I just want to like congratulate you uh, 
lastly here, just Thank on you, your Tyler. on your success. Uh, it's it's been really cool to watch, and and uh, I loved hearing your story because it's the kind um, where I don't know. Um, it seems like the way you approached it is a way maybe many could approach it, and if you have the passion right. and the love for it and and the dedication, the devotion, it seems like it could be something an attainable goal. And uh, I think I think what you're doing is awesome. So thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much, Bob. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Take care. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit thenifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, Brian Brown. Uh, I forgot to ask him what table at Blade Show he'll be at, but I know he'll be there. Uh, so we'll we'll get that information out uh, when it comes out. Uh, also, be sure to check in next week for another interview and Thursday Night Knives, of course, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Join the conversation. It's always a blast. And then you can also uh, check us out completely right here on uh, all your favorite whoa, over here podcast apps and download us. Listen to us on the way to work. Listen to these smooth, soothing tones when you're in traffic. All right. That's it for me. And uh, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher until next time, please don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.